the wonder of it all. Sunday morning. He's an associate pastor up in um, Sherman, Texas. And um, he was asking me what I was preaching on, and I told him that I was still preaching on the devil. It made me think many years ago I was pastoring a church down in Lookout Valley. I pastored that church for some 20 years. had an evangelist there one time by the name of R.B. Kelly. And one night during the meeting, he got sick. And I had to preach. The next night, he got up. He said, well, I appreciate Brother Newton, Newton preaching for me last night. And he, started, he said, and, and I had preached on hell. And he said, uh, I appreciate Brother Newton preaching for me, but I hear he gave you hell last night, and, uh, <laughs> and I've been uh, giving you the devil. I made this statement the other day, but it's, it's very true. We must not focus on the devil. We must not focus on the darkness. We must focus on the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. But we need to be aware that there is a devil. I have preached the last couple of weeks on the subject, the Christian's adversary. And I got about halfway through the message, and uh, uh, then I uh, tried to preach the second part last week, and I got about halfway through that. So today, I'm preaching the second part of the second part of the first part. You say I'm confused. You can't imagine how I feel. But uh, when I first started preaching, I used to wonder how I could preach 15 minutes or so. I find that that's not my problem anymore, and I want no amens for that. Um, our scripture, our text scripture, reminds 
remains. 1 Peter chapter 5, beginning reading with verse 6. 1 Peter 6, or 5, 6. 1 Peter 5, 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. Casting all your cares or own anxieties on him. Because he cares for you. Then he says, be sober minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion. Seeking someone to devour. Verse 9, resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. He tells us that we have an adversary that will attempt to hinder our Christian life and walk and relationship with the Lord. May the Lord bless the reading of the word. Our Father, I pray again that you would help us. Father, we need to hear from you today. I pray that you would help us to be true to the word of God. Help us that we would be led and anointed by the Holy Spirit. Father, you know about every one of us. You know where we are right now. And you know how we're thinking. And you know what our burdens are. And our needs are. So Father, I pray that you would minister to us today. Lord, I would surrender to you. I would ask you to speak and minister to our hearts today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The Christian's adversary. As Christians, because we are Christians, we are adversaries. Sometimes you run on to folks that think that when they get saved and they come to Christ that their problems are, are over but the fact of the matter, some of them have only begun because we will be opposed. The Bible clearly delineates for us that there is a devil and that he is the adversary of God himself and all of those who trusted Christ. When you study in the word of God, whether you be in the Old Testament or the New Testament, when you see someone that is endeavoring to live their lives for the glory of God, you will find, or as they did, that they have an adversary, someone that will try to hinder us. As I read in the text in verse 8 of chapter 5 of 1 Peter, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour and I have been telling you that we want to try to in these messages deal with a factual study finding out what the Bible has to say you know it's interesting that we live in a day uh, and I'm certainly not going to get into this that many political issues are moral issues they are, the Bible is coming up in the face of what some are trying to propagate. 
you can go back to the garden where, where Lucifer, the serpent, if you please, deceived Eve. And he said, did God say that thou shalt not eat of the trees of the garden? And she said, oh no, he didn't say that. He said that we could not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And he said, thou shalt not surely die. How many of you know that's a problem? God is saying one thing, and the devil, and the devil's crew is saying another thing. And the, and the church, and I'll say this and go on, the church today is facing whether we're just going to fall in lockstep or whether we're going to stand for the word of God. We have been considering some basic characteristics of Satan's habits, and we have looked at three basic uh, characteristics associated uh, with his personhood. I think it's important that we understand our adversary. We understand our enemy, who he is, where he came from. What are his methods? What is he doing? What are his goals? What it will be his destiny, if you please. And by the way, like so many subjects, the Bible is where we go to find that information. Now, we have seen previously that uh, the devil has the three basic characteristics associated with with uh, personhood. The devil is a person, not a human, but he is a, an, a, an identity. He is an individual. And like any other person, he has intellect. The devil is not dumb. And may I say to you that the devil is experienced. If you think you can hold, you can handle him alone, you're wrong. He is more powerful than you are, and he is more experienced than you are, but he has, he has intellect, he has emotion, and he has will. I talked to you about emotion, or about intellect, and that uh, how he came to Jesus in the temptation as recorded in Matthew 4, 1 through 11, and he approached the, the Lord Jesus Christ in a way that he would approach no one else. He cannot approach us that way. He said, if you are the son of God, he's challenging who God is. He said, if you're, if you're God's son, if you are God incarnate, Scripture says that he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights and he was hungry. And he said, if, you're, if you are the Son of God, speak to these stones and cause them to become bread. And Jesus answered him and quoted Deuteronomy and said, Man shall not live by bread alone. But what I'm saying is he used his intellect. He, he approached the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 2.11 says, And so that we would not be outwitted by Satan. Satan is smart. Satan is witty, if you please. For we are not ignorant of his designs. By the way, as we go down through this Christian life and, and we face the onslaught of the devil, we need to learn from our experiences. We need to learn from our failures, if you please. Because he just kept on coming. I thought it's interesting at the end of that record of the temptation of the Lord Jesus Christ. It said that, that he left him until a more convenient time. The devil will come and he will approach us. And he really likes to get us when we're down and when we're discouraged and and uh, we may avail ourselves of the word of God and the spirit of God and, 
the Lord may give us victory. But, beloved, as long as we are in this world, he will be back. He will not give up. Ephesians 6, 11 says, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand, uh, to stand against the schemes, the King James says, the wiles of the devil. He's tricky. Most of the time he doesn't come straight on. He'll sneak up on you. As I say, he will uh, come at you in a weak moment when you are sick, when you are heart sick, when you are disappointed. That's when he will come at you. And then we saw that that he uses uh, emotion. You can see in the scripture where uh, uh, where he has his his pride. And he has his, his wrath. 1 Timothy 3, 6. And he must not be a recent convert talking about elders in the church. That he might be puffed up. He will, uh, he will tempt people for whatever reason to be puffed up and to be proud. Why? Because he's proud. And, and then in the Revelation it, it says, uh, Therefore rejoice, Revelation 12, 12, O heaven. And you who dwell in them, but woe to you on earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you, talking about the tribulation period, with great wrath, because he knows his time is running out. Just to tell you the truth, since you brought this up this morning, I'll just say to you that I believe the devil knows he's running out of time now. And he's pulling out all of the all of the uh, the things that would hinder him. He he, he's going at it with all of his strength because he knows he's running out of time. In Romans 12, 7, it says, And the dragon became furious with the woman, speaking of, of Israel. And may I say to you, the devil is furious at the Jews. The devil is furious at the church. And the devil is furious at that Christian, uh, toward that Christian that is, in, that is endeavoring by the grace of God to live for Jesus Christ. Furious. We have an adversary. The devil also exercises his will. I also often marvel at that statement in Luke 22 where the Lord Jesus told Peter, and I mean this is, this is in the upper room, this is a day from the crucifixion of Christ, and, and Jesus tells Peter, Satan hath demanded or desired to have you. But he said, I have prayed for you. And may I say this to you right quickly, and you, those of you who are around here often hear me talk about that statement that Samuel made, God forbid that I should sin against, against the Lord by failing to pray for you. I want you to know that every one of us and most of us uh, that are in that's in this building today. We're not necessarily what you'd call young people. We have children, grown children, grandchildren, maybe great grandchildren. I want you to know they need to be prayed for. They need someone to stand in the gap and pray for them because I want to tell you they are facing things we never faced. They need to. And, and the Lord prayed for Peter. Now. Here we go. I would like to give you five additional things that we, we find in the scripture that helps us understand. These are personal qualities, uh, elementary profile of this lying and murderous adversary. And it, it comes from the word of God. The first thing that we need to know, we need to understand about the devil is that he is, initially was a created angel. <coughs> you know, if you read the book of Romans, you will see we are warned that we worship God and not the created. I've read um, 
coincidentally, I guess, in my reading, the daily reading and study several times where I got to some of those scriptures in the Revelation where John was um, in the presence of an angel and, and he was like Cornelius in the book of Acts. He, he, um, uh, he fell down before Peter and, and John fell down before the angel and wanted to worship the angel and said, don't do that. I am your fellow servant. Don't worship me. Listen, we are not to worship anything or any entity or any person other than the Lord God Almighty. Amen. We are to worship him and he alone. But the devil is a created, and I might add, fallen angel. Colossians 1, 6 I've been noticing in my reading and because I read it in the Old Testament and then I read it in the New Testament and how many times I've come on recently references about sometimes people think the only place that you find creation is you find it um, in the beginning chapters of, of Genesis. I want to assure you that's not true. You even find creation in the Revelation. And here in Colossians, 116, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, where the thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all were created by him and for him. And may I assure you that Satan, or the one that we know is Satan or the devil, was originally created by God, and there's a very strong probability that the devil, or Lucifer, the archangel, was the most glorious creature God ever created. By the way, that's what got him in trouble, was his beauty and his glory. You know, we, we see the response to Job where he talks about the morning star. You know, the book of Job is, I, I'm, I'm sorry you can help me with this after church, but the book of Job, and I read it twice every year, but 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 I, I, I have trouble in Job because of his friends. I just, I just, I just get tired of those guys. I, I like it when Job's talking, but down in the end, and, 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 and Job was a righteous man, and he was living right, doing right, and, and the devil approached God, and God said, have you considered my servant Job? And, and finally, he, he lost everything he had. He lost his children. He lost his health. And, and then his good buddies came along and said, you know, this just says to us that the reason this is happening is because of sin in your life. He was getting no comfort anywhere. And even his wife said, why don't you curse God and die? Now, I'm not quite as hard on Job's wife as some people are because, you know, she'd lost everything herself. and She was having a rough time. But, I mean, finally he was struggling and saying, what's happening? What have I done? God, why are you letting this happen? But in the latter part, part of, of Job, in so many, so many words, and I won't take the time to read the scripture that I have here, but, but God says to Job, Job, where were you? Where were you when I created the heavens? Where were you when I created the earth? When were you, where were you when I, when I put the boundaries on the waters of the sea? And you know what eventually happens? Job says, I think I will shut my mouth. By the way, that's a good idea. We're talking about a finite creature talking to Almighty God. I want you to know that's an important statement in the first verse of the Bible that's in, in the beginning as far as what we know in the creation of the world. In the beginning, God, He never had a beginning, never has an end. He is all-powerful, all-knowing, and omnipresent. I think we would be better off if we listened instead of talking. That's a good place for an amen. I need one of those fans y'all had around here. But 
but I could hold I lost mine. He said, Amen. I can do the preaching and amen in, but it takes longer. Okay. Well, we see here that he is a created, he is a created being. And, uh, you know, I've been wanting to say to you that in these, I don't know, there may be one more message, maybe two, I don't know, but as you go through these, it's necessary that you repeat some scriptures, and I think I've read this scripture before, but we learn through repetition in Ezekiel 28, 13, talking about the creation of the devil, of Lucifer, the archangel, and you were Eden, you were in Eden, the garden of God, every precious stone was your covering, sardis and topaz and diamond and beryl and onyx and jasper and sapphire and emerald and carbuncle and crafted in gold were your settings and your engravings. On the day that you were created, that means that there was a day when Satan was not. Lucifer was not. Then it says in verse 14, And you were an anointed guard, an anointed guardian cherub. I want to tell you something. There's not many entities that can save that. You were an anointed guardian cherub. I placed you. Why was he there? God placed him. I placed you. You were on the holy mountain of God in the midst of the stones of fire. You walked, and this may mean more than this, but he was in the throne room of Almighty God. In fact, he was part of it. Verse 15 said, And you were blameless in your ways. He was holy from the day you were created until, and this is a this is a statement that's just shocking, until unrighteousness or sin was found in you. Well, that'll make you shake your head. In the abundance of your trade, you were filled with violence in the midst, and you sinned. So I cast you as a profane thing from the mountain of God. And I destroyed you, O guardian cherub. You talk about falling. He fell from the covering of God. He fell from being the song leader of heaven, the worship leader of heaven. And unrighteousness was found in him, and he was thrown down. He became the prince of the power of the air. He was originally created like Michael, the archangel. I was talking about Job. It's like in the early part of Job, it says that the sons of God came before God speaking of angelic creatures and God's different management distributions, if you please. And, and uh, Lucifer, the fallen <coughs> archangel, the fallen covering of God, came with them. And on two different occasions, God said, where have you been? What have you been doing? He said, I've been going up and down in the earth. And we read in 1 Peter a minute ago where he says, seeking whom I may devour. I don't want you to have any doubt. And I want you to know you're looking at someone that knows what the devil can do to a life. I used to tell the guys in the prison, 
sin will carry you places you never dreamed of going. And boy, they used to say, Amen. We have an adversary as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He is a angel of darkness. He is the beginning of liars. He is a murderer. His goal, as I've said to you before, but I think it sums it up, and I think we need to understand, and it will cause us to flee to the foot of the cross, his desire, his goal, his ambition, his ambition is to drag your naked soul down the back alleys of hell. We have an adversary. Second, Satan is a spirit being. You know, that, that's, that's kind of hard for us because the Bible teaches us that there is a spirit world. In fact, the spirit world is more real than ours. And it's out there. Uh, I hate to tell you this, but there are spirits in this room today. And some of them ain't nice. God is a spirit. Originally, the second person of the Holy Trinity was a spirit. The Holy Spirit is a spirit. Angels are spirits. The reason we know about the Lord Jesus Christ in his incarnation, and by the way, the Christmas story is about is not about the birth of the second person of the Holy Trinity. It's about the incarnation of Jesus Christ. God the Son became a man. Anytime you see an angel, and we saw them at Sodom, we saw them in the tomb. We saw them on the mount as Jesus ascended. They were angels who had taken human form. If they hadn't, we wouldn't have been able to see them. Angels are spirit creatures, and Satan is a spiritual being. And in order for him to appear, he has to take the form of an, of an earthly person. Let me say this right quickly. I think we need to understand that the devil is active in the world today. We've been studying the book of Daniel in, in our Sunday school class on Sunday morning and we have recently studied a chapter where Daniel was praying and trying to figure out what God was going to do about his people and he prayed and he fasted and finally Gabriel, first time we see Gabriel, appears to Daniel and he said, Daniel, uh, you who are greatly loved, greatly favored, we, God heard your prayer initially, and he sent me from the throne room of God, but I was hindered by the spirit of Persia. So the devil is at work. The devil has a plan. The devil tries to hinder. The devil lies. The devil leads people in the wrong way and tries to influence them. And as I say, he is wiser than we are. You know, I've been reading recently over in well, I read it in Kings and then I read it in Chronicles. You know, after Solomon, the kingdom divided. Ten tribes went with Jeroboam and two tribes went with Rehoboam 
And that's that period of time where you have good kings and bad kings, mostly in, in Israel, bad kings, and occasionally you had a good king. And Jehoshaphat was a good king. He was the king of, of Judah. And then Ahab, he was a very bad king, king of Israel. And he called for Jehoshaphat. And, and, and you know, uh, I hate to tell you this, but if we're not very careful, good men can do dumb things sometimes. Uh, and Jehoshaphat went down, and Ahab said, I, I would like to see if you would help me with the Assyri Assyrians. And he said, you, you're, you're my blood, you're, your skin is my skin. Uh, we're kin, our ancestors are the same ancestor. You sure I will? He said, by the way, do you have, is there a prophet that we can inquire of? And um, he said, well, I have, and, and uh, 400 prophets came and said, go up, go against the, uh, the king of Assyria, everything is going to be fine. But when you get on down in this uh, 1 Kings 22, 21 through 23, you'll find out uh, that there was a time when these different ones that appeared before God came to him and, and uh, God was saying, how can we hinder them? Uh, and, 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 and it indicates that the devil came and said, listen, I will put a lying spirit into the mouth of his prophets. And that's exactly what he did. And they went down and they were defeated and Ahab got killed. The spirit of the devil, the spirit of darkness, the unclean spirit, as the Bible calls him, as Jesus called him, the evil spirits, influenced the people. Satan is a spirit being. Third, Satan possessed extraordinary mobility. I said this to you the other day, but I'm going to say it again because that I've said it many times because I think it's very important. There's two mistakes that people make about the devil. The first mistake they, they make is that they make him equal with God. Satan is a created, God created the devil. Satan does not have the attributes of the devil. He is not omnipresent. He does not know everything. He is not all powerful. So do not equate the devil with God. The second mistake that people make about the devil is that they think they can handle him alone. You cannot handle him. You cannot outsmart him, outthink him. You don't have the power in yourself. We read a minute ago where in several different places in the New Testament he says, put on the whole armor of God because you're in a battle. You need the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of, breastplate of righteousness, shoes, your, your, your feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You have the shield of faith and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And I want to encourage you by saying the last thing I said to you last Sunday, he that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. Satan can't do anything to you that God doesn't let him do, but we need to be very careful we do not open ourselves up to him. The fourth thing that I want to mention, mention to you about Satan <coughs> Satan can function both in heaven and on earth. We've already seen where God said, where did you come from? He came, said, I came from the earth. He is not omnipresent, but he can move real fast. He is an angel. He is a fallen one. It says in Revelation 12, 10, And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of God and the authority of Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down, who accuses.
accuses them day and night before the Lord. Did you know that Satan will come into the presence of God and the children of God, he, I mean, if we have problems, if we fail, if we sin, the, 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 you know, we, when I was a boy, we used to, we had, used to have a, have a, be, a bugle, a, a beagle dog. And we call him Smokey Joe Newton. And uh, the only thing about that dog, like a lot of dogs, is he would drag up every old stinking thing he found. You ever seen dogs do that? I'm not trying to be ugly. I'm just telling you. That's the way the devil does. He's going to drag up everything he can. The Bible says that he is the accuser of the brethren. He accuses us before God. But we need to be glad that the Lord Jesus Christ is our high, high priest, and he sits before the throne interceding for us serving is our propitiation. Amen. Let me, since you brought this up, let me say this to you. If it were not for God, if it were not for the Lord Jesus Christ, he would tear us up. Amen. You say, you need to calm down. I'm, I'm calm. <laughs> and then finally, fifthly, that's the one you're looking for, wasn't it? God will hold Satan morally responsible. You know, I mentioned a minute ago, I believe, that there's a couple of scriptures in the Revelation that Satan is cast out of heaven and that he is angry and that he knows that he's running out of time. And he certainly, he certainly does. Because he's judged and he knows it. He's on the way to the lake of fire and he knows it. Did you know that the first messianic scripture in the Old Testament is found in the third chapter of Genesis where that the Lord says, speaking of Satan, he will bruise his heel, but Christ will bruise his head. Satan wanted Jesus dead anywhere but on the cross. You know, that's the reason around Easter we ought to rejoice. I was in Israel a few years ago and I went to that which is recognized as the tomb of Jesus and I was talking to a lady after that and said, did you, go, did you get to go to Israel? Yes, I did. What did you see? I told her some, some things. She said, did you see Calvary? I said, I saw Calvary. She said, did you get to go to the tomb? I went to the tomb. You didn't go in the tomb. I said, I went in the tomb. Oh, I bet you that made the hair stand up on the back of your neck. And I said, no, not really. But I said, do you want to know the significant thing about that tomb? What is it? It's empty. The angel said, why seeketh the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. We serve a risen Savior. And they keep trying to dig him up. But he's not there. God would hold Satan morally responsible in the end of his treacherous existence. Matthew 25, 41. Then he will say to those on his left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, talking about the great white throne judgment, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Hell, the lake of fire, was created for the devil and his angels. Somebody said a long time ago, if you go to hell, you'll be an intruder. Revelation 20.10 says, And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur or brimstone where the beast and the false prophets were. They've been there for a thousand years. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. You know, oftentimes I hear People say, well, you know, they got rid, they got, they got away with it, didn't they? No. 
Why? Because ultimately we're going to stand before God. You know, we I was telling them in Sunday school, I heard this last week that in California there was this 73-year-old woman that got in her car and there were four teenagers jumped in there to steal the car and threw her out of the car and took off but her arm got caught up in the seat belt and they ripped her, her arm off and she bled to death. You know, sometimes these things happen in certain places. Prosecutors don't even prosecute them. But there's a payday coming. There's a payday coming. And Satan's payday is coming. The Lord one day will deal with it. May I say to you finally, it must be recognized that if we fail to find Christ in this life, then we remain under the dominion of Satan and will acquire I hear all the time, I'm getting to the age now that I hear all the time about this one's sick and this one's dying and this one has died and, and, and on and on. And they're not all old people. There's nothing more important than settling the question between us and God that we be saved, that we be born again, that we call, make our calling and election sure. When I die, I want to go to heaven. You say, oh, you just want to miss hell. You bet you, Bubba. <laughs> I sure. Jesus said, behold, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. Paul said, for me to die, for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Paul said, to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. When I die, I want to be with him. I want to return with him. I want to rule and reign with him. I want him to give me a little corner somewhere. I want to be involved in that thing. Is there anything more important than that? Well, we have an adversary. And you may not know him. salvation to the Lord Jesus Christ for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved Christ died for us he bore our sins 
our sins are imparted to him and his righteousness is imputed to us. Glory to God. I remember when old Dr. Sheffield used to say, fellows, if we wasn't so used to hearing it, we'd shout every time we heard it. If we understood eternity, Father, I thank you and I praise you. I thank you for the faithfulness of the Holy Spirit. And I pray that you would speak to our hearts today. In Jesus' name.